driving over shortly, um, and I'm medical director over at United Healthcare Community Plan, previously 
um, overseeing the CRS program um, since 2008. Thank you. And hello, this is Deb Lettington. Um, I am up in Flagstaff, neonatal nurse practitioner representing Northern Arizona Healthcare. All right, thank you all very much and welcome to all of the new members again. Uh, we'll, uh, first time in a long time, we have no issues with the quorum. We have, a, I think, a record for the number of the committee members who've attended uh, a meeting. So we'll just go ahead and uh, jump into agenda item two and just, uh, just for, the, for our guests or members of the public, at the end of the agenda, we have a call to the public. You'll be able to come up and, and you know, say your piece. And, uh, the only thing is that under the public meeting law, the committee members can only really address issues that are on the agenda. So, you know, that's uh, just something to keep in mind. So for the year in review in, on tab two, on the on the binder and for the members of the public the binder is already or will be uploaded onto our website so you'll be able to access all of this um, we have our uh, annual data review of uh, newborn screening disorders that have been found um, so i'm not going to not going to go over that but what i am going to do is uh, a couple of introductions for new people and then uh, one of our recent disorders critical congenital heart defects uh, our, we've partnered with the birth defects program here at ADHS, and they are doing the surveillance, and they have a presentation that we're excited to see on CCHD today. So first person I'd like to introduce is Wendy O'Donnell. She's our new newborn training educator. Some of you may or may not uh, know Sandy Aponte, who's retired. She'll be retiring at the end of this month, and uh, so welcome. We also have... Uh, People probably know the new office chief, Soma Bhakta, who's also the acting uh, laboratory uh, supervisor, and she's been with the program for quite a while, but uh, we're happy to have her here in this role. And a new acting assistant director, Jessica Rigler, also attending today. Good morning. Yeah. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to, I'm not sure if uh, all of you are, okay. Yes, Diana and I. <laughs> okay, thank you. I can stand it for you, but wherever you want to stand. Wherever. Either way, it's a very short overview. Um, um, a really quick recap about CCHD. Most of you know the history, but um, July 2015, it was mandated, and the mandate required screening, and if you're screening, you need to report. Um, September 2015, we were able to finalize and disperse new blood clot cards that had the pulse ox reporting section. Um, those took a little while to get into the hands of people. People, a lot of facilities were still using up their stock of the old facilities. So while they were, they were implemented and dispersed beginning in 2015, I'm gonna say they weren't fully in use until early 2016. Um, so in 2016, newborn screening spent a ton of time doing education, trying to make sure people understood how to do the cards. We saw a lot of errors in reporting. We had implemented a failed screening uh, fax form. So if they had a failed test, they were supposed to fax this form. A lot of education happened around that to try to make sure people understood the form, why and when and how to submit that. So that was a, a busy year for newborn screening and not a lot of good data as a back. Um, in 2016, towards the end in 2017, we took um, a, kind of a, a really first good look at our data and pro Primarily, we're trying to focus on the positive screens and what those two outcomes were. So if we could get a handle on our false positives, if we were screening true CC, in catching true CCHD, other important um, abnormalities that we were catching. So that was really what we focused on those first two years. Um, so that brings us to this year where we finally feel like we have two good years of data. Um, you know, 20, the beginning of 2016 was iffy but we have full 2016, full 2017, and now we're on the verge of having 2018 data. So we finally feel we're at a place where we can look at the data quality, look at trends across the time. We know most of the hospitals have been educated that facilities should be using the forms accurately, and if they're not, then it's a conversation we have to, we can have as to why, because nobody can now say, well, we didn't know, we didn't have that form. So we really think that we're kind of 
at an important place where we can get some important data. Having said that, we're not going to share a ton of specific data today because with all of that, we we're, finding, we're finding errors, we're finding issues with data quality. We don't know if it's simply typos or somebody marking the wrong box. We don't know. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but we just want to talk kind of about how many screens we're doing, what it looks like in Arizona, um, and really where we're, we're hoping to go this next year with some complete data. And now Glenda, our FE, will talk about that. Um, so, so 2018 has been rather busy. We've been thinking of how we want to move forward with activities and assessments of the CCHD screen. Um, and really so far it's consisted of a CCHD screening work group um, as well as, again, has, how Diana mentioned, um, thinking of the data and reporting needs for the program. Um, so again, we have a CCHD uh, data work group that involves folks from the newborn screening program, the Arizona birth defects monitoring program, and additional collaborators both internally and externally, um, depending on what activities are going on at any given point within the work group. Uh, and the tasks vary um, by activity and at uh, any given point, um, but usually they range between education, outreach, training, surveillance, quality assurance activities, and evaluation and analysis. So through this work group, we started gathering uh, different ideas for what data we want to look at moving forward. And one of these was looking at just this, uh, the number of pulse oximetry uh, screens that have been reported through the database. Uh, so here you see a total count of pulse oximetry screens that have been documented um, through the newborn screening card uh, by year. So the total has been over 200,000 since September 2015, and this is data looking uh, up to end of October 2018. We also started looking at the total number of fails um, for the pulse oximetry uh, screen uh, that were documented within our database. So you can see here the trend of number of fails um, total since September 2015 to the end of October 2018. So, so far it's been a total of about 270 fails or positives. Um, so we thought we'd take this number and go ahead and compare it to the CCHD uh, failed forms that were back to the, to the state lab. And so here you see the trend in red of the total number of fact forms that we've received for the total number of fails. Um, so ideally, we would want to see that number matching more closely to the total number of fails within the Neometrics database, um, but clearly there is a little bit of a variation. Uh, so, so we were wondering, you know, why this could be, um, why there is this uh, difference um, through time. So to clarify, the blue is what's being reported on those pulse ox cards, and the red are what they're faxing that follow-up form. So if they have a fail on the pulse ox, they're supposed to send a fax form. Issue number one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So, so this made us think, okay, well, maybe we want to implement a more thorough a continuous quality improvement set of activities. So keep on uh, implementing existing processes that are currently happening and potentially implement new ones. Uh, we want to monitor these activities through time and then eventually start to report those findings from the CQI activities. So some of these examples would be looking at internal and external training. Um, Sandy has been doing such a great job in educating um, throughout Arizona. We really want to keep up that momentum, just thinking of uh, the natural fluctuation of staff and things like that. We also want to continue doing internal training to be able to see how the data is being entered, um, how we're running those reports to make sure it's really as clean as can be so we can get an accurate count of past sales, uh, not screened, et cetera. And then we hope to set some goals to, for these quality indicators so that we can get a clear definition of what we see improving versus not. And then once we, we start setting up those different metrics for um, CQI activities, uh, we want to move that forward, forward and do a different kind of data analysis. So thinking of more uh, evaluation of, of the pulse ox outcomes. So uh, the Arizona Birth Defects Monitoring Program mm -hmm. will continue to have a role and the surveillance of CCHD screens, um, but we'll also begin doing an evaluation of this CCHD screening. So thinking of validity, what are the true count of, of children who have a CCHD versus not, and relating it back to their pulse ox outcomes. Uh, the feasibility of the screening, so are we really reaching the level of success that we want with the population that we're serving, and other such measures like that. And so this goes into a little more of the different kinds of reports that we'll want to do through the evaluation. So thinking of false negatives of the infants who passed the pulse ox, how many were found in the birth defects registry with some type of CHD? 
um, and even a subset of false negatives, so infants who passed away with a CCHD or CHD and had a pulse ox pass. And then also thinking of true positives, so infants who had a pulse ox fail or were positive and were found in the birth defect registry with a CHD. And also looking at prenatal cardiac diagnosis from the newborn screening card to be able to get a more full um, picture of the pulse ox outcome and additional reports as needed. Before uh, the committee members have discussed or ask questions, I wanted to give Dr. Gonzalez an opportunity to introduce himself. He's uh, one of the new members. Hi, uh, sorry I'm late. Uh, a patient. Uh, we have a little murmur, actually, kind of ironic. That, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a pediatrician in the Valley. I've been practicing uh, pediatrics for 25 years. I'm in private practice at Scottsdale Children's Group, and we actually just merged about four practices together, and now we're Arbor Medical Partners. Uh, I've been involved in the Arizona chapter of the Academy for as far as I can remember. I was even their president at one point in time. Why they elected me, I don't know, but <laughs> that's what it was. But I'm very honored and humbled to be part of this group. You're welcome. Thank you. So for agenda item two, any discussion or questions or anything the committee would like to? <coughs> Can you tell me one more time how many per year you found? Because we're expecting it to kind of look like the hearing numbers. Uh, what the total number of children had a positive? Yeah. Uh, so far, it's been about 270. For two years or for per year? Since September uh, 2015 till October of 2018. Okay. And that's based off the data that we found from our from our database. Okay. So it's considerably less. We're we're expecting for our hearing, we expect about 200 kids per year, um, and that's about what we're finding. And so, the preliminary when we're looking at planning for this, that's about what we expected in CCHD. So any baby that's uh, prenatally diagnosed is not going to be screened. So we oh, have so these would sh not yes, would these would not correct. show right. The exclusions for screening include a prenatal cardiac diagnosis or admission to the NICU. Mm -hmm. So those are going to be a, a lot of the children that actually have a CCHD. So with this screening, we're actually. We don't want to catch that many kids. We're hoping that they're being prenatally diagnosed, properly cared for, delivered in the right level hospitals. So these are the kids that didn't get that. Didn't get that. Uh, yeah. So we, we want it to be a low number, <laughs> and we expect it to be a much lower than the total trend of CTHDs. Do you year. have the numbers for total at all, or is that hard? To we do. Um, the reason we went with this today is because we're seeing a lot of issues with the data. We're doing a we, Glenda is doing a ton of data cleaning, and that's what brought on these additional CQI projects. Because in looking at the data, we're seeing so many mismatches and so many errors, and we don't know where those are happening. Um, we'll, we'll look in the pulse ox, and it's a fail. We'll get the report that's a fail, but then we go into the medical record, and we're only seeing passes being documented there. So was that a later CCHD? Was it a different criteria? We don't know. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of what prompted these conversations about before we present more data at an annual meeting that's being recorded, <laughs> we're going to <laughs> we're, we're gonna look at our data and clean it up. Um, at the October meeting, we did talk a little bit about what we've found so far, um, but we decided not to go that route because of the reasons. I mean, it's a great project. It's exactly what we wanted when we took this on. Um, we want good data, and we want to see what we're finding. Glenda said about 270, you know, since we started. It took us a very long time to good, get good hearing data, so. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. So, I'm excited about what we might have next year. We can certainly communicate. If anybody wants more information, we're happy to kind of relay that. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question for you. You probably mentioned this before because I was late. Uh, is every hospital involved in doing pulse oximetry? That might go more to do more screening. We, I believe they are. They're supposed to be. Yeah. 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 By state law, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. even the, the small hospitals yeah. in Southern Arizona and all are all doing it. Yeah. 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 I would think yeah. we have a nurse practitioner from Northern Arizona on the phone. Um, but it's by state law supposed to be done. Okay. Yeah. And okay. that includes it should be. we have yeah. our midwife yeah. programs, our, our smaller. Yeah. Even the birth centers, centers that are non hospital in Tucson are doing it. Right. And by mandate, if they're screening, which they're supposed to be doing, they're mandated to report. So we should get everything. Um, we haven't done a time that new, newborn training would look at the facilities. I mean, as a practicing physician, any one life is, is enough. And you're, the smaller hospitals, kids. the facilities are the ones that we're more worried that didn't get that prenatal right. diagnosis. Right. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Thank you. So I, 
I have two questions or comments. So all NICU babies, at least in ours, do get CCHD screened, but they're usually long after the newborn screen card goes out, and is that why you're not including them in your numbers? So if the newborn screening card was checked as NICU, correct. Okay. Um, we do have some, and Sunday can speak to this, we are seeing some screenings done much after that 24-hour period, right. like 133 hours after birth, really odd times. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we else we want to look at. Right. Are those screenings that are done in the NICU later on? Um, and how are they being reported? Why are, when, at what point are we getting them into the MS? Right, because any baby on oxygen in the NICU can't have a PCHG screen done. Right. We have to wait until they're, you know, off oxygen. So it could be done at five weeks of age. Right, you know, at that point. And that's why it therefore does not make it to the card is what I'm suspecting. Correct. That would be um, and then the other question I have is not all congenital heart disease is supposed to be picked up by the CCHG screening. What do you look at as failed? You know, is it that is a fail the child who passes of a um, failed screen? For instance, we had a quote unquote failed screen who at three months of age was diagnosed with total anomalous pulmonary vein. Now, that's not necessarily expected to be picked up on a CCSG. Would that be considered a fail? So right now, the way, the way we're looking at it, no, sorry, no, thank you for that, thank you. Um, from my understanding so far, the way we're looking at um, CCHD, the pulse ox, um, positive or fail, is based on the Kemper algorithm. So depending on what the pulse ox actual measurements were, we apply the Kemper algorithm and say pass or fail. Right. Um, then with time, we hope to be able to match them back to what was in the birth defects registry and then say which specific cardiac defects they had, so we'll be able to map out specifically which of the defects and if we want to consider them part of the primary targets or the right. secondary or whichever else. Because all the get. BSDs aren't going to be picked up and ASDs aren't going to be picked right. up and all those kind of things yeah. and are not going to be picked up. Exactly, and that's one of the assessments we want to do once we get a little more comfortable with the data to be able to see which of those CHD cases we're actually catching and if there are more dominant ones than others. Right. And, and, and do you use the CCHD or just CHD? I was just about that. to respond to that. That was exactly right, yeah. So it's interesting trying to break them down between yeah. CCHD and CHD because you're right, you wouldn't expect to catch many of the CHDs, the VSD, ASD, things like that. Right. Um, the ones that are now, we do have a list from APHL who, and, and CDC and, and uh, National Birth Defects for Defense Network kind of has a list that we've compiled that are pretty much CCHDs okay. and they match what we already collect in the birth defects registry. So looking back, once we have the data complete for a year in the birth defects registry, we would take that back and try to look at those babies and see if they passed or failed. Okay. So if they passed the screening and ended up with hypoplastic left heart, that's not good. Right. If they passed the screening and ended up with coarc, that's expected. Right. We still want to catch them, and surprisingly, we actually are catching a lot mm -hmm. of coarcs um, that were not prenatally diagnosed, so that's exciting. And but hopefully. that mild stenosis may not get picked up. Correct. So that's what we're going to go back and look at. And that's the value of having the programs working together okay. because we do collect that data through the birth defects program and we'll be able to look at true positives, true fails, mm -hmm. um, false okay. positives, false fails. Yeah. To follow on your question you said about the transposition of the great vessel, how would we know, unless the physician is diagnosed. I didn't say transposition, I said tra a total knowledge plan. Oh, total knowledge plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whether well, they're very different. Right, right. But how, but, but let's say it's diagnosed at this date, right. right? How would uh, they know that it was a negative or positive unless the physician lets them know? Well, that's, that's part of my whole question. How does that get picked up? Um, because so at first it was normal. Physicians to let you know, oh, by the way, the post ox was negative, but it ended up having this. That's the so, only way you would pick up false negatives in that sense. So that's the value of screening. So right. if the, the pulse ox card, if the baby was born seemingly healthy, Which they did the screening, they passed the screen and they right. went home, then we have a record, we have the neometric database that collects that as that baby passed, no issue. We then have our birth defects data and we would pull the, all the babies that had a CCHG uh, from the birth defects the data and then cross back and reference that to, you know, okay. cross match it to this. So the ones that we missed then are those babies that were in the NICU and not screened we didn't know why they were in the NICU. They just weren't screened because of the NICU. They didn't have a CCHD, nothing, no screening. We have no idea. Okay. So those, there are some misses, and we've had some conversations with about that. Would it be valuable to um, still try to get a full stop screen? Would it be? I mean, and I would, I would think that all NICUs do screening before discharge. 
and, and when I was part of a national NICU um, bulletin board, we all talked about when this started in 2014-15 that we did a CCC trial once they got to room air, or if they're discharged on oxygen, they automatically got an echo, even though we didn't think there was any heart problem. And that should be, I would think, I mean, I don't know what you see in, in seeing babies that come home from the NICU, but that it behooves us to do similar screenings. No so, baby should go home without a CCHD evaluation. So the question would be, and that would be something we can work with education, how do we then report that? Would we use right. the newborn screening card? Because we certainly don't want to hold up the full no. house results. Um, but would it still be valuable to use a newborn screening card and send it in with just the full sock, whether it's 15 days or 65 days and send it in? And then how do you, how do you keep that data clean when you're looking at 24-hour results? Right. You Unless you just don't want to make but, yeah. Yeah. but that's okay. definitely worth conversation, and, and that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. Uh -huh. um, one of the reasons uh, that this whole screening program got, got pulled into the state screening program, I mean, it was going on before uh, people were screening before it became part of the state uh, uh, list, was the reporting function. Uh, do, do we know, are, are cardiologists, uh, are they responsible for reporting? What, what, how, what's the... I'm at what level? Uh, for these late pickups. So, under the birth effects program, which is where we're expecting to get the diagnosis, um, we do queries based on codes and, and different processes, and so then the cardiologist would certainly be responsible for providing records if we request them to confirm. The cardiologists, in generally, as a rule, are not reporting full stock screening. Just because it's at that 24 The hospital does the CCHD screening report, right? Okay. So none of this is going on in the cardiologist's office. Okay. Right. No, it's, it's done before discharge from any newborn. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Nor in the pediatrician's office. Right. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I do get a past screening for hearing and pulse ox, yeah. and then four months later I'm listening to a heart murmur. <laughs> I wouldn't call with you guys because they say, oh, by the way, right, right. there's a heart murmur here, right. or a BST or whatever it was. Right. I don't know how to go around that, but. But again, a BST wouldn't be a. It would be picked up. It anyway. would not be a false negative because a BST is not expected to be right. picked up. And if that's, that's the right. question where I have with the report. And not classified as a CCHD. Right. And, and so that's where we put, yeah, we have put our results as far as our looking at the false positive, false negative. We have the CCHD category. We have another critical or another heart cardiac category, which would be your VSDs and anything else. And then we have kind of another significant. So you have a diaphragmatic hernia or sepsis or something that we're glad we caught, but it's not a CCHD. That's how we're trying to look at our sales mm -hmm. to see, you know, even if it's not a CCHD, if the baby, right. if we caught sepsis in that baby respiratory, exactly, exactly. Yeah. we're glad. So yeah. we want to acknowledge those, even if it doesn't fit into that right. perfect reporting of a CCHD.
we can do something like that if, if, if the committee wants to meet before you know another year has passed. They want to meet semi-annually and reconsider something again after that. That's certainly an option. Um, so I think the first one will be spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, do we have? Uh, we have some speakers. Um, we weren't aware that we were actually doing another presentation. At the last advisory committee, we did a full hour's presentation on spinal muscular atrophy. And I'm having a little bit of computer problems, but um, we can sort of talk you through um, the discussion we went through last time, give you a little bit of um, background on spinal muscular atrophy and where we sort of are with um, the treatments and, and screening in various states if you want to do that. Because you still have the, the deck from the last time. Sure. Was, was your presentation at the, at the partners meeting in the morning? What were the we talking about? Yeah. Last, uh, it was March. 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 The last yeah. advice. Yes, I remember your face. Okay. It was yeah. uh, so it should still be up on our website. Right now. Yeah. There's four of you who were here at that time. Right. There's yeah. six of you who are, <laughs> are new. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just to give a little. Can okay, you introduce yourself first? Sorry. Uh, I'm Carolyn Jones. Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, public policy and government affairs uh, with Biogen. And for the past six and six years or so, have been working with various state um, laboratories to get spinal muscular atrophy up and running and to work with Cure SMA to um, have it added to the federal panel. Um, last um, February, uh, the panel, the advisory panel voted to add SMA and the secretary signed off to add it to the federal panel in July. And so uh, in preparation for that, we came and gave a presentation in March on spinal muscular atrophy at the committee. We didn't have a, um, a full committee at the time, and so we were invited back. I just wasn't sure what, what you wanted to hear again, um, but since you have six new members, we can sort of start uh, from the beginning. Uh, I can download this, and I apologize because it still has the March date. Um, some information has changed, um, but um, willing to do that if, if the committee wants this deck again. For everybody else, so that they can have it is back on the decision. Online. But while while we're moving forward, um, spinal muscular atrophy is an autosomal recessive disorder of um, the alpha motor neurons of the spinal cord, and it's caused by it causes a loss of motor function. Um, it is. Um, Prior to a treatment, it was the number one genetic cause of death in infants. Um, it uh, manifested with weak muscles, uh, difficulty with uh, swallowing, uh, joint abnormalities, respiratory difficulties. And generally, babies in, uh, with this condition were just managed with uh, supportive care. Um, it is um, various types of SMA, um, type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 being the most severe um, uh, condition, and uh, it is the severity is related, kind of, <laughs> slightly, uh, with the uh, backup gene that folks have, which is the SNN2 gene. That if you have more copies of the SNN2 gene, generally um, the condition is less severe. And um, we've can't find it. The only thing we have posted on our website is what was in the what binder was last time, which okay. is in their binders again this time. Um, that's the commit. That was the presentation that was done at the advisory committee meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, it gives you a lot of information. I think I think that was in your background material. It gives you a lot of information about the condition, and, and most of that information is correct as far as the types and, and so on. The information that is a little bit askew in, in that presentation is the, the treatment and, and, and so, sort of all of that. But before we get into, um, um, and I will let my um, counterpart here talk about the treatment and what we've seen since. But as far as the newborn screening aspects of it, uh, we spent a lot of time working with the CDC um, to come up with a uh, diagnostic screening test for uh, that could be utilized in the newborn screening lab for SMA. And we, uh, just a little bit about my background, I started out this life as a medical technologist. 
And so I was very concerned that any new tests that would be added uh, would be able to meet the needs of the newborn screening laboratory and that it would be not too costly. So working with the CDC, we came up with a test that could be multiplexed with SCIS um, at a cost of between 25 and 50 cents uh, for the testing. Uh, CDC has spent some time validating that test and is actually on the next generation um, of, of the test. They've updated it. A number of labs are uh, uh, working to implement SMA screening in their lab. They're validating that test method. I recognize that here in Arizona, you guys use the Kirk and Elmer um, test system for SCID, and that particular insight system does not allow multiplexing. So um, it would require uh, new instrumentation for, for you guys unless you wanted to change over and do your own lab developed test and utilize the uh, test system that um, was developed by CDC. Working over, I believe, has the. But uh, just from what I understand, Perkin Elmer is working on a next generation. Their time frame for bringing on the next iteration of uh, the SCID SMA sort of. Um, will be um, in line with the California date. I don't know, for those of you who are in the newborn screening world, California passed a law several years ago that if a condition was added to the RUS by the secretary, <coughs> California has two years to implement screening in their state. So um, California will have to implement SMA newborn screening by July 2020. Uh, Perkin Elmer estimates that it will be, it will have a test kit system on board by July 2020 in order to accommodate California because it is their largest customer, 450,000 births a year in that state. We just met with the Perkin Elmer representative yesterday. Do you think they already have something ready for court? Yeah, he said he can provide a quote based on what kind of Right, so Perkin Elmer may be a little ahead than a little ahead than that. Of course, as you pointed out, we are in the, the old system, so we'd have to it's more expensive than twenty five to fifty cents for us because we'd have to get all new instrumentation. Um, and to address those concerns, one of the things that CDC um, in discussion with the uh, Cure SMA and an industry coalition that Biogen is not the only company that is developing. Um, a, a treatment for spinal muscular atrophy. So they developed a newborn screening coalition within Pure SMA that is working with CDC to get funding uh, through the CDC Foundation to provide labs who want to apply for grants for funding to assist them with the purchase of instrumentation, with the purchase of reagents, and so on. We're also working at the federal level to get increased funding for the CDC to assist labs, not just in SMA implementation, but we, um, as I've become involved with newborn screening over and over, it, it blows my mind that you would have this mandate uh, sort of for the states to implement these new conditions without providing some sort of resources to help you get up and running. So uh, there is a coalition of patient advocacy organizations and industry people that are working to get additional funding through CDC and to HRSA to allow states to have the funding necessary to implement these conditions as they come on board. Because ours is not the last. There are a whole host of uh, conditions that are standing in the wings waiting to come on board. And uh, something has to be done if we really, really want to address the needs of babies because um, uh, one of the things that we have looked at is while um, we looked at SCID, um, that it was added, and how long it took the states to get up and running, and that's because of a lack of resources. But if the federal government, states really care about these babies, we need to find a better way to resource you guys as you try to implement this new condition. So um, that's where we are on spinal muscular atrophy. I know you're aware that Utah, New York, Massachusetts, Georgia are actually screening uh, Georgia in terms of a pilot, but they do not intend to stop the pilot. They intend to move, continue after the pilot, but part of their law requires them to do a pilot before they implement. Um, uh, Massachusetts is the same. Massachusetts will not discontinue the pilot, but their law requires them to 
quote unquote do a pilot before they say that it's fully on board. Um, there are other states, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, all of Maryland. There are about 13 that are in the process of validating SMA newborn screening. Um, uh, we are working with some others who are in the situation, the same as you with Perkin Elmer, who may need resources. Um, but it's moving, it's moving forward. And just didn't want to say add SMA and, and, and you guys think that there, there are efforts afoot to get you the kind of resources that you need to, to implement not only SMA but the other conditions as well. And um, with regard to uh, the treatment, um, it, uh, you had some data presented last time showing um, uh, how the children have been uh, impacted by having um, Spinraza on the market. Um, Carrie Jason, who's uh, one of our MSLs from Biogen, we had hoped to be able to um, present this, but I had a, I can mouth one on but I'm on the slide. This is necessary. Yeah. yeah. Before you get to the treatment, can you educate all of us on what the incidence of it is? When does it begin to be manifested? I've never had a patient with SMA. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I know it exists, but I have not. It is one in six to 10,000 births okay. are, are impacted. Um, one in 40 or one to 50 are carriers. And parents who carry them don't even know that they're carriers. Right, so right. One, in, what, one in six to 10,000? Okay, um, so in Arizona, Nine to fifteen. Right, roughly. No, those are, that's all variety of severity, though. That's so all some variety. Some had a newborn onset versus years of age. Huh? Yes. And and the um, the onset depends on uh, whether you're type one, type two, or type three. Um, the type one generally onset within a couple months. Within a couple of months. And so screening, newborn screening. issues, all that stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With eating issues, swallowing issues, and all that stuff. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Eating issues, yeah. so basically what we as physicians begin to determine about what's going on here, why is this kid not swallowing well? Right, right. Correct? Right. Right. Yeah. right. And so some of the first manifestations are like tongue, tongue fasciculation, um, breathing, like a bell shaped chest, breathing abnormality, and presentation. That's so usually what alert. And so, yeah, a later onset, they may have meet motor milestones and then start to lose their parents will notice that they're not moving their arms or um, something like that. that. That may be six months out. But the type ones generally present with them. So they start, quote unquote, I'm talking about muscular now, normal, and then they regress in their motor function, is what you're yeah. saying. There's a large amount of like in the type 1 severe patients, just to paint a picture, the type 1 patient will never sit unassisted, okay? Uh, usually permanent ventilation or death by 13.5 months of age, that's natural history. Um, our treatment has changed that, especially if you can get it in a pre-symptomatic uh, kid before they exhibit symptoms of SMA. Uh, but that's so... You know, essentially, prevalence is type 1 is more prevalent, type 1 and type 2, and then on to type 3 and type 4 from a prevalence standpoint. Um, we, our product is FDA approved to treat the spectrum of spinal muscular atrophy through adults. Uh, the bulk of our data is in infants and um, later onset, so beyond like 18 months of age, like that, two years. Point. From a pediatrician's point of view, hypotonia and A-reflex are going to be the big yeah. right? deal. Hypotonia and A-reflex. But you know, the, the deal is that the, the, the gene that's listing is called the survival motor neuron gene, and the survival motor neuron gene prevents the deterioration of anterior size and mm -hmm. newborn cells. And uh, it takes a while to, to knock them off enough to present. Although well, there's some kids that present before birth, I think about type zero. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's very much presentation. There's, you know, what's what's very common with the very severe form that you see very, very quick. There's profound 
found motor neuron loss before um, symptoms even start to occur in these infants, like we're kind of demonstrating that through uh, biomarker neurofilament uh, that um, has been presented. Um, but in our pre-symptomatic infants, we have roughly about a uh, follow-up period of about two years, um, follow-up period of infants that were treated before symptoms occurred, so within a few weeks of, of birth. Uh, they were diagnosed either by having uh, a sibling with SMA mm -hmm. or the pilot newborn screening study, but they were able to get treated pretty rapidly before symptoms presented. Um, just to, you know, I provided that context of the natural history. Eight out of the 15 uh, two copy SNM, which is conferred to develop SNM. SMA type 1, uh, 8 of those 15 uh, patients are ambulating without assistance at 2 years of age. Es essentially tracking uh, with normal milestone development. Um, and I can kind of show you. So this is kind of the top infant score, this little gray area here. And um, healthy infant, and that's the other way. So that's the top of 10. So this is just the magnitude of effect if you treat early versus those that are already systematic. Uh, this is our sham, that gray line below. Okay, They're treated 15 months later because that's the you know, essentially when they came off the Endear study. So they're trending, they get benefit, but obviously it's not as magnitude as if you're able to do a pre symptomatic thing, right? So here is the So this is the who, like when the window was in when you're able to sit with support. Okay. These are the types these are the two copy patients, three copy patients. So. <coughs> this is standing with support. Oh, you working? <laughs> <laughs> and this is walking without assistance. Some of those patients that are encouraged to be. I mean, I think the results. I, I was at a Cure SMA meeting um, uh, on Tuesday, and it's almost gotten to the point where um, they're believing that they won't distinguish patients by type any longer because of the treatments that are on that are coming that are on the market and that are coming to the market. It's just going to so change the face, the natural history of SMA uh, that. Uh, you know, they will be looking at people just living with the disease instead of these children dying at 13 months. Yeah, uh, what's not being said here is that gene therapy for this is on the horizon. Uh, you, can, you can plant the gene using a virus, it becomes an episome in the cell, and it doesn't get intercalated into the DNA, it's, it's its own DNA presence. It may last for a very, very long time. And uh, that's probably the next yeah. thing that will happen. I think that's more cost Probably more They've submitted for FDA approval already, right. so it's in process of being approved so, for infants. So, uh, yeah, the field's moving very, very fast, and there's tremendous reason to start to get this yeah. up for And whether it's a gene therapy or our therapy, all of these babies benefit by being treated early. early. The best results occur when they're treated early. And that's why for um, the five years that I've been working on newborn screening, we, um, we supported newborn screening <coughs> each time we didn't know whether our therapy was going to work because we knew that any therapy that came out were to be have the greatest impact on the type 1, they would have to be treated early. And that's why we newborn screening for SNA. Do you have data that compares? So about a third of our moms are all screened for carrier status for SMA? 
Um, do you have? Um, is, that, is it that, is that high? We have quite a few. Is that high? Wow. Yes, one of our, one, yeah, a couple of our oh, genetic, genetic, our couple of our um, OBGYNs just routinely screen all, and they offer it to all is their moms. Isn't that a recommendation of the? Of the it is. So that yeah, so CF screening and SMA screening, we probably have about a third of all moms well, are screening. Why isn't it higher than that? I don't know why. Uh, cost, I think, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything too. Sorry, I think, I think, yeah. yeah. Especially if people have no insurance or they're, you know, I don't know yeah. whether that all gets paid for if they're on federal emergency right. assets or not, you know, all those different variables. When, you know, 55% of our babies are born in access. Yeah. Uh, my name is Angel Wolf and I run the Arizona chapter for QSMA. And, um, I, my daughter is 15 and she has type 2. When we were diagnosed, it took us over a year um, to get a diagnosis and that was having a pediatrician who is quite knowledgeable, um, having many blood tests done, CT scans, MRIs. So after over a year, we finally got a diagnosis. Most of the families that I encounter, um, including myself, have never heard of SMA, have no family history which is the importance of newborn screening. Um, at that time, there wasn't any offer of any um, maternal um, diagnosis or genetic um, testing. And I will say the babies that we see coming out now or, or the infants, and I have a couple of um, families who are here who can speak about their process, um, it is much different now in the children that we see who get treatment right away, they, we have type 1s who are ambulating and walking. And so, you know, some of those families will say they are type 1 and when we tell a physician that, they kind of question <coughs> because they're ambulating. They look very different than what we know as SMA type 1 babies. So there is a, a very critical piece to having newborn screening and get the, getting these children the treatment that they need right away before the motor neuron loss happens. Um, and with that, their experience is very different than mine and what's happening right now, especially with Benraza being on and then gene therapy being kind of on the horizon. I met with Dr. Burns this morning with two as the main treating physician of infants and children here in Phoenix. And he said there was roughly about a four-month delay in diagnosis here in Arizona before he gets to, to see the infant. I'm just thinking about an education <coughs> for us pediatricians to look at the warning signs for it as well, for all of us. Yeah, well, if you have the screen. Right, if you have the screen, that's it. Home. Now, I've got a question for you. You said there's like six or seven pilot studies that are being done in several states. Are any of them promising, or are there any have them already implemented along yeah, with the city? Yeah, so Utah uh, implemented early this year. Utah did, okay. Yeah, and they've already identified two to three patients That's and wonderful. found those within two weeks. So essentially, uh, the positive newborn screen gets directly into the neuromuscular specialist, and they clear out their schedule specifically to Community. So, have you talked to 
any other hospitals um, in Arizona about possibly doing a pilot? Or were the pilots in the other states um, sort of authorized through legislation or the pilot out? in the pilot in New York was um, there was a neuromuscular specialist in New York City that knew about the treatments that were coming online, and she worked with the New York State Newborn Screening Program um, to help initiate the pilot there. Um, it, at the time, um, we were supportive. Again, we didn't have a product on the market, and it didn't seem to be self-serving for us to, to help this along. But right now, um, it, it, it needs to be initiated by the, a clinician or something working with um, your newborn screening program. Because the, the samples in New York were sent through the newborn screening program just as if that was my second question, whether or not the samples would have to go through the state lab. Because if that's the case, then, yeah, it could be, it would be a voluntary piece, or it would have to be an agreement yeah. with the state. Um, I, one of the reasons why I asked, too, is, is I think the board mentioned, the, you know, there is a, there's a budget situation. And I think the more, um, you know, <coughs> it, it will take, um, it's going to take that village, and it's going to take information um, to sort of, get funding approved, and so the more, uh, if you could do pilots here, that might, that might, I, I, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just one thought. And I can speak a little bit to that because that is part of my job is educating and talking yeah. with the physicians and the hospitals, and I will tell you it comes back to budget and manpower staffing. Um, one of the facilities that um, we, we've had some discussions about that, they don't have enough staff at this point um, or a budget to be able to do that. That is something that they are willing or willing to consider, uh, but that's where it comes back to, unfortunately. I, I like, like that you're including it with the skitties because we were what, one of the last few states to finally add skitties, which is embarrassing. Because even though in this area we never had it, you know, Phoenix, Tucson, <laughs> You go to Tuba City, yeah. we have the highest incidence with kit. It just didn't make any sense. So it's interesting that, that the pilot studies are on the East Coast, and California is starting what you said, California. Well, actually, um, you can blame that on me. What, what, we, what, we, <laughs> what we did was to look at the states that were early adopters of, yeah. of different things. We um, There was a pilot in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin is screening, but not implemented by the state, but they are doing But May Baker, who was very instrumental in developing the skid test, uh, was very, very engaged around SMA. And we went to um, uh, Massachusetts, because our, that's our home base. That's where our company is. Um, and, and New York came to us. Uh, California and uh, has the law in place. So California is um, initiating relationships with Perk and Elmer to, because unlike you, California has five labs that do screening across the state. So implementing anything in that state just sort of like blows your mind. So we got in early to talk to them. And, and in my mind, it wasn't set to say, you need to start screening right now. It was more like, let's not wait till the decision is made by the rust and then you, everybody gets on that motor and starts running around. But let's think about how we prepare your state for implementing. So for the past three and a half years, even before it was on the rust, my goal was to just go around to the state to warn them that this was coming and to um, get them thinking about the, their resource needs and actually asking what their resource needs were so that when we go to meetings on the Hill, uh, there are a number of people in Washington that are very supportive of newborn screening. In fact, we met with a few of them this week to, to try, as we, as we said, to get federal funding to help with this process. But, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to see a 12-year lag the way we saw with kids. And we took the time to go through 
all of the conditions that had gone through the rest previously to see what was good about the process, what was bad, and we tried not to, we tried to pull out what was good. And one of the things that I saw that was lacking, and maybe that was because I was a laboratorian, is the outreach to the state newborn screening labs before you go in and say, oh, I need a piece of legislation, or oh, you, you, you need to do this. And that was our effort back in March when we came to, to sort of just get you on board, get you thinking about the fact that this is coming. What, what, do, what do we know now in terms of estimates to put something like this up? Um, back in at the last meeting, we were still waiting for uh, Perk and Elmer's process, to, I guess, for FDA approval for their new <coughs> test that would multiplex get an SMA. And from what we just heard yesterday, they're ready to offer quotes, but we haven't seen it yet. So, but as uh, I think Tonal said, and, and as you said, that uh, it's going to require different instrumentation because it's a totally new method for SCID. So. We just, we just don't know yet. We're going to have to, like I said, we just found out yesterday that Perkin Over is ready to, to uh, offer a quote. So. What they're, what, I'm not speaking sadly about Perkin, they will sell you components to do this, but the actual FDA approval of it is still not going to be until 2020. Oh, really? Okay. So I, right. they can give you quotes. Gotcha. I just want to warn you gotcha. because it's a little bit disingenuous, and I just need to. So you have to bring it up yourself, laboratory development. So if you had to bring it up yourself, that would be very different. That's a whole, whole new machinery in it, whole business, right? Yeah, because we didn't go with the CDC method. Yeah, I don't know if you have any sense from that when you're comparing costs for the CDC method. Because it's, it's very different, too, because for Kenoma, it's a reagent rental, whereas in LBT, we'd have to purchase instrumentation up front. The cost for reagents, um, testing reagents, wasn't as much, but it's the upfront cost of all the instrumentation, the real-time PCR, the liquid handler, which is taken for handling a large volume, um, and all the consumables it would take. So um, I don't recall what those numbers were at that time. Well, that's a, that's a good fact. Well, I mean, the, the, this is the big elephant in the room here. A lot of things for which we're going to hear are very worth doing, but they're going to be stopped at an economic level. And it's almost as important to hear about how we can change that environment as to talk about the disorders. And, and look at the lifelong cost untreated or delayed treated um, when you're factoring the cost of upfront versus later. And what are the, the costs for, for a child that, that is not diagnosed through a newborn screening program? What what kind of costs do you have? Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but what I can tell you is um, before we were diagnosed, we were in the hospital almost every six months for pneumonia or RSV because of the um, <coughs> weakness, our kids cannot fight off colds like you and I, and so because of their respiratory um, being more compromised, they get sick more easily. Um, we spent, um, shortly after we were diagnosed, but before really there was, the Raza wasn't out at that point, um, we were just starting to get some of the medical equipment into our home. We spent um, 37 days in ICU, and I can tell you that was a very expensive bill, thank goodness we have insurance. Um, and it included a, um, uh, we took a helicopter from our closest hospital down to the children's hospital. So that was one visit um, for one year. Uh, so it, it, the expense is, is large for And for how many live births sure. do we have now? Yeah, you should be 90, 95 now, it's down to 85 right now. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, 50 cents, I mean, per test and, and compared to the cost of 55% of the babies are on access, I mean, you do the math. And I think you'll find for most of the disorders that are added to the rust that, I mean, that's part of their evaluation, the cost benefit, right. and it's generally positive, it's just a matter of what Dr. Alex said. Mm -hmm. is, you know, that may be the case that access or the insurance companies save a lot of money, but we still have to come up with the money in this program up front to 
May, may I ask you guys a question, and I don't know this about Arizona. I know that there are some states that are reluctant to get grant funding to help with the addition and implementation of new, is, is Arizona one of those? No, we actually had uh, done that for SCID. We had applied okay. for grant funding for SCID, yeah. So there was a, a cost analysis of care um, that was presented at AMCP in 2017 that indicated like currently an SMA diagnosis about 37,000 a year. So yeah, to your With hospitalization. I was wondering, um, after treatment, is there, do you have any evidence or do you have any data on what evidence-based um, treatment is as far as therapies for families? So is it is there any evidence on is physical therapy and physical therapy or feeding therapy getting a child up to the developmental milestones? No. So we had, you know, the Endear study, which was SHAM controlled an infant, and basically that was standard of care. Those infants were receiving standard of care and they still progressed versus being on treatment. And treatment essentially, in most cases, was delivered early enough to be able to, you know, halt progression or actually improve on more. Were you asking more, um, does one require more untreated a, or later treated a more intensive um, type of therapy that's more costly in general? And my gut feeling, I don't know this for sure, but I'm thinking that you're going to get therapy regardless if you have delayed or the condition. And the only difference is you're going to have improved outcome and less burden. Um, so, for instance, if you're going through a, a rehabilitation program on therapy, you get stronger gain muscles, essentially. So, that hasn't been studied in the context of treatment yet, so I think that could be proved that there's been some anecdotal reports that were formed that improved above and beyond. So, I did a little bit of an analysis from the early intervention perspective on the children, and unfortunately, I can't do too much of analysis because we don't have that many children in the early intervention program over the past nine years I was able to do an analysis of the children with um, SMA, um, but I can't give too much data because there's such a small number in our, in our um, system. Um, the amount of children, so given the children that have come into our system, with SMA, most of the children were referred into early intervention from PCPs or hospitals or nursing facilities. Um, most of them did receive physical therapy or occupational therapy um, or feeding therapy. The children that came in um, to our system from an early standpoint, um, from an early age, ranged from about five months to nine months of age. Those children did exit our program with greater outcomes and did have, they had pretty intensive support. Um, the children that were referred later on ranged from about 18 months to 24 months. Those children actually exited our program with lesser um, outcomes. Um, what type of outcomes are you talking about? So in early intervention, we actually um, measure child outcomes. Um, there's three child outcomes that we measure, social emotional outcomes, they're um, taking appropriate action to meet their needs and acquiring new skills. So for most of the children, especially the later they, that they came into the program, um, from later age, um, they, it seemed like their outcomes were lower when they exited. In which of the three areas? In all of them, but the acquiring new skills seem, um, seem to be less. Compared to? Compared to when they came into our program at an earlier age. Gotcha. So and this is just an average, yeah. um, but they, for the children that entered our program, um, a number of the children actually exited our program entering the Part B program, which is special education for children at three which is a great thing because that shows that entering an earlier intervention, um, the early intervention providers did provide the families 
enough support to really show that entering special education is a great thing for your family and going and having your child enter the school district is good. And the child was supported enough and at a um, functional level to actually enter special education at three. Some of, um, some of the children did deceive within our program, so they, unfortunately, um, that was one of the outcomes. But for some of the children, they did make progress, so. And you said it was for the last nine years? Since 2011, I was able to look at the data. Okay. So, again, you probably don't know whether those children were receiving Benraza at the time, which, okay. That, I mean, that's relatively new. And a handful of the children um, were able to, in early intervention, receive assistive technology. Um, they were on bent break in receiving nursing services. One of the early intervention requirements is to do child find activities, and we do measure child find on two scales, but one is versus one. So seeing that, um, just advocate for, for this. Um, if we were able to get SMA on the newborn screening panel and find children earlier, we would be able to get them into the early intervention program earlier, which um, we did have more children actually in the early intervention program after one year old that had SMA. So. I just for the interest of time, unless there's an objection, I wanted to just table the SMA discussion just so that we can make sure that uh, the XALD uh, presentation can go forward and we have enough time to get a uh, call to the public. And I think we still have enough time today. Unless there's a... Uh, is it appropriate uh, at this point? I mean, we're advisory committee to the uh, head of health and services, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they take that to the governor or whatever. Is it appropriate to make it a, a motion that, uh, that we move forward with it? Yeah, we we can do that now. If you can, if you certainly enter, you can entertain a motion, or if you want to wait till after the call to the public, if other people want. Well, I think it's fair that we wait for the call to the public, but I want to know that we can yeah. take oh, yeah. some action. Yeah, we have a quorum. So. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So, you, you, you. I know there's a video. Was there someone who's going to queue it up? From yeah, I'd like to start with the video, and okay. I'm going to talk after. Oh, would you? Okay. All right. So. Five-year-old old Carter Brishler has always been a daredevil. But just before this video was taken in August 2015, Carter was diagnosed with a disease that has left him without the ability to see, hear, eat, speak, or even move on his own. It all started with what his parents, Stacy and George, thought was a lazy eye. It was just like venturing out to the, to the outside and then coming like quickly back and I'm like... Like it was going out of that? focus briefly. Carter was fitted for glasses, but the problem only got worse. Uh. Stacy and George knew something was wrong when he started becoming disoriented. He would be running and then stop and go like... Uh. I'm like, buddy, go get your brother. And he'd be like, where? I'm like, right there. After several doctor's visits and no answer, Stacy took Carter to a local hospital near their home in Fort Jervis, New York. At first, doctors were dismissive when Stacy asked them to scan her son's head. So they finally did it, and then that same doctor at 1 o'clock in the morning had to come to me and say, there is an abnormality in your son's brain. Carter was sent to Westchester Medical Center for testing. In January, Dr. David Cron finally diagnosed Carter with adrenal leukodystrophy, or ALD. It's a progressive disease which causes damage, ongoing damage to the white matter of the brain. The disease is linked to the X chromosome, so mothers are carriers, but it mainly affects boys. Symptoms usually start to show between the ages of three and eight. It could be a picture of ADHD in a child, or difficulty walking, difficulty with vision, sometimes difficulty with hearing. They may have skin color changes, and they may have difficulty finding infections. While there's no cure for ALD, there are ways to monitor and treat the disease if it's found early enough. When patients are symptomatic, 
generally a little bit too late to do anything which is really effective. Um, so nowadays, if we can find patients in the pre-symptomatic phase of the disorder, then there's a good chance of, of success with bone marrow transplant. Carter was not a good candidate for a transplant because of the advanced stage of his disease. The advocates are pushing for ALD testing to become part of a regular newborn screening. New York is currently the only state testing for the disease, and it began two years after Carter was born. You have kids to watch them grow and to play sports and have build relationships, friends, get married, have kids, you know, life. You have kids for them to live. ALD is almost always fatal within one to ten years after diagnosis. Now, the Breschlers are just trying to make every day count. You can follow Carter's story at facebook.com backslash courage for Carter. I'm Dr. Manny, Fox News. Hi. Great. Mind introducing yourself to the show? Sure. Thank you. My name is Justin Diagostino. I am a 34-year-old man with adrenal leukodystrophy. Been dealing with it for about a decade now. It's, uh, it's no fun. Um, <clears throat> but I have the non-lethal form of the disease. There's two, there's two varieties to ALD. The first is called C-ALD, or cerebral ALD. That boy in that video has it. It's life-threatening. It'll wipe you out. I have the adult variety of ALD, which is called AMN, adrenal myelineuropathy. It's not necessarily uh, life-ending, though sometimes it feels like it is. <laughs> um, so this is pretty simple, and I'm so glad that I finally got here to share this information with you. I've been trying to do this for almost a year now, and it's not easy. But um, we've already hinted at the value of newborn screening in our discussions, and there's been some comments made. In fact, ma'am, what's your name? Mine? Yeah. Deb Houck. Deb. You mentioned something we were going around introducing ourselves. You said that you have two children one of which is still alive and right. one of which isn't. Right. And potentially the determining factor there was knowing ahead of time, screening. Exactly. Well, that's exactly the truth in ALD. If you're screened early enough with ALD, you have a very good chance of survival. Whereas if it progresses and you become symptomatic and it's caught too late, well, your life's over. And that truth is borne down on me. Um, I had a younger brother. His name was Jason. He uh, passed away in the year 2010 from this disease. And the reason for that is it snuck up on us. We didn't know, we didn't know anything. He wasn't screened. We didn't know anything. And then all of a sudden, he was losing all kinds of motor functions and intellectual abilities and cognitive abilities, and it just took us by storm. And um, I'm a firm believer that had newborn screening existed in 1987 when my brother was born, he would probably still be alive today. And so newborn screening for adrenal leukodystrophy is critical. And I'll explain to you the reason why newborn screening we have developed, the team, doctors around the country, we have developed a therapy that is remarkably successful. successful. It's a bone marrow transplant, and it has a 95% success rate in maintaining survival in the people that are treated in it early enough. If you're treated early enough before symptoms really progress, the bone marrow transplant has the ability to halt the progression of the disease and to save your life. So it's pretty simple. Myself, Janice here, Janice travels around the country. We are trying to move adrenal leukodystrophy, newborn screening around the United States because it's a matter of life and death. And we want to ensure the safety 
We want to ensure the livelihood of Arizonans. That's why we're here. And this newborn screening will do that in regards to ALD. So it's that simple. The test is simple. The test actually for ALD screens for actually several other diseases. So it's not just, you know, one thing. It's a, it's a pretty comprehensive test. Uh, it's already been implemented in about a dozen states now. That video was old. You know, Newark was one of the first. But now it's in about a dozen states, Washington, California, New York, Massachusetts. And uh, we're, we're wanting it to go national. In fact, there's a law right now in our federal Congress called Aiden's Law. We are just trying to move it nationally. But we're also moving state by state. And I live in Arizona, and I want it done in Arizona. And I'm not going to take no for an answer. In budgetary concerns, heck, let's tax. Let's a $5 tax on every Arizona or a $10 tax. Let's make it work. It has to work. It has to work. This is a critical component and is so important, so valuable. So I thank you all for your time and hearing me speak. I'm also going to have Janice. Uh, John and Dean, the four of us here, are all deeply affected. Uh, myself, John, and Dean, we all have ALD. Uh, Janice. Uh, so do I. Well, you have ALD, too. She's a, yeah, we all have ALD. Uh, it's different in men and women a little bit. It's a little bit different because ALD is what's called an X-linked recessive, so it's more severe in boys. It's more severe in boys, but nonetheless, men and women do have it. So I'll let Janice now speak about ALD for a second. Go ahead, Janice. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm Janice Sherwood. I'm from California. I'm actually a, a Arizonian from uh, birth. I grew up here for about 19 years and then had traveled around quite a bit and found my home base in San Diego area, in this California. Um, I became involved with ALD. The first time I heard it was when my son was diagnosed. Um, back in 2003. He only survived six months after that diagnosis, and he wasn't diagnosed accurately until he had an Addisonian crisis uh, that landed him in the hospital where he had severe swelling in his brain. They had to insert a shunt to release the pressure and drain the spinal fluid, and that was the, the nail in his coffin because that caused the disease to progress very rapidly. So six months later, we lost him. So. Um, Taking him to many different doctors, trying to find something that could slow the progression of the disease, I found myself educating the doctors about this disease. And so after my son passed, I started my foundation, which is Fight ALD, Fighting Illness Through Education. So I started going to medical conferences and educating doctors and nurses, um, standing at a booth in the exhibit hall and trying to get them to understand um, simple simplicity of doing a blood test if they're evaluating a boy for attention deficit disorder, because it's the number one misdiagnosis for this disease. What's actually happening is they're losing vision or hearing or both, so that's translating to problems at school. If they actually are diagnosed at that earlier stage of the brain involvement, they could be a good candidate for a stem cell transplant. But again, unfortunately, most boys progress with symptoms before they're um, finally diagnosed. Once I learned about the symptoms, realized my son pretty much had every single one. He was born with an undescended testicle. He had strabismus, had surgery for strabismus when he was four that didn't correct it, but we were just told that, that sometimes it doesn't. But so all of these little things, ADD again, uh, recurring viral infections, and I had asked for a CAT scan also when they diagnosed him with childhood onset migraine and was denied one. I was told that ADD didn't cause migraines and that there was not, nothing neurologically wrong that would warrant the expense. Three weeks later, my son had another migraine and it went into adrenal crises. And that's how I got diagnosed. So I did give you all some pamphlets with information and I just kind of want to briefly go over what this information is. Um, since we got newborn screening passed in California a couple of years ago, we found that there was really a need to have more information available for the families once they got the diagnosis. Um, we're identifying older siblings with ALD off of these newborns that are in the school system and now they've got their diagnosis. Some of them are on uh, cortisone treatment. So I developed three different brochures. So the one is, the first one is the one that I give to the doctors when I go 
go to my medical conferences. The second one is what we give to the families once they are given a positive diagnosis. It kind of just lays it out for them that you can enjoy your son for this first year. You don't really have to be freaking out that he has this horrible disease because it usually won't um, manifest until between the ages of 3 and 11. We do have certain things that we do implement throughout that first year for blood work and MRIs. Well, not even MRIs anymore in the first year. I'll go into that in a little bit later. But um, the third one is one for the teachers and the school nurses so that they can understand more about the disease and they can actually even maybe identify it in a child who hasn't been uh, diagnosed with it yet, just off of some of the common symptoms that they might see being presented in the classroom. So once we initiated screening, um, California being the third state, we really need to have a standards of care put together. So we've been meeting with the uh, specialists from around the world annually now. We're coming up on our third meeting in January. And so I worked with the doctors at Minnesota that specialize in doing the stem cell transplants. And I did want to throw out there that the 95% survival rate is with a matched sibling. Yeah. So that's not just anybody that goes in for stem cell. Um, we actually are getting ready to open a second phase, second trial for gene therapy. We've already done three phases in the first one with 30 boys in the study. All but two have done fantastic. And the two that didn't, they progressed faster than what they had um, identified them to be at the stage that they put them in for the transplant. And unfortunately, a second one was taken out and put to bone marrow transplant because the family was feeling confident about the gene therapy. So the both, those two boys did not make it. But now that we know that with gene therapy, there's no um, risk of host versus graft disease or the GBHD infection, which often will kill any patient for any disease that has to go through the stem cell transplant. So we put together the standards of care so we know that we will do blood work on them and see to monitor uh, for adrenal insufficiency starting at between two and four months. And then we'll repeat that every six months. And if we see um, a change, then we would do it again in four months. And because we want to wait, we don't want to immediately put these boys on cortisone therapy unless they really are going to require it because they'll have to take medication the rest of their life. Um, we'll start doing MRIs. The recommendation is either at 12 months or 16, 18 months, excuse me, just to get a baseline rating. It's very unusual to have any uh, cerebral involvement that early. Uh, we did run into a problem in New York where they did, they were doing the first uh, MRI at the age of one, and the boys are still developing their myelin at that time, and so unfortunately two boys' um, MRIs were misread and were put through bone marrow transplant at the age of one. And um, so we stopped that practice now and are doing it now at 18 months, and then again at three years of age. And then starting at three, we would do it every six months along with the, the blood work. So we can see changes in the brain. We start to develop a lesion. Those lesions can develop very slowly. So when we're seeing boys that are symptomatic, they've been developing lesions for quite some time. For my son, looking back you know, on his history, we could see that there was changes going on for a couple of years. It just wasn't very prominent at that time. So the second page is um, the map of the state. I didn't have an updated one, so I did a lot of scribbling on it for you. But um, it does show that we are screening currently in 10 states. We have two states that have just completed pilot studies and are getting ready to implement. We have another eight that are, um, have already approved it, and they're working on getting it implemented sometime in 2019 or 2020. We also have quite a few other states that are rallying. We've got a lot of families around now that are um, working with their states to try to get them moving on um, the addition as well. But since we have been screening, uh, California has a higher birth rate than Connecticut and New York. We were anticipating 50 to 55 babies diagnosed a year. We're at about 65 to 67. So that's bringing this number of incidents down to about 1 in 9,000 births. Uh, we've already diagnosed over 250 in the three years that we've been screening. And the, the seven other states just started implementing gradually throughout this year, so it's really based on three states. And then the last one I want to just give you a, a little cost analysis. 
This is from Washington State that they ran before they initiated the screening there to show what it would cost to add it to their panel per baby. And this is implementing what it would cost for the laboratory and the administrative fees and everything. And it comes down to under ten dollars baby. Now if you have a child that's diagnosed late and goes through stem cell transplant, even though it may not be recommended, some families do that and these boys will survive. But we have a family actually the mom who got newborn screening in Connecticut, her son just turned thirty. But he's been in a vegetative state pretty much since he was eight, since he had the transplant. So the cost to the state for all the programs that he utilizes, because he still is picked up by bus and taken to a special school, and he's got home school, you know, home nursing, and all of those fees can come out to so much more money than this ten dollars per baby for screen. So I would ask that you guys add it to your panel too, and that we can get these boys diagnosed. Get them monitored and get them into treatment before it's too late. Thank you. Yeah. Is it okay if I stand? I like yeah. standing so I can look around and see everybody. Uh, my name is John Cooter. I'm 26 years old. I'm a mechanical engineer. I actually design HVAC work for a lot of your medical banner facilities, so it's really cool that I get to talk to doctors who work in this space. And I'm a product of pre screening. So um, I was. Uh, Pre-screen-ish, I would like to say. Uh, I was diagnosed with ALD at the age of one years old, and that was only because of my brother, who was six years old, succumbed to ALD. So for his journey, um, at the age of six, started losing a lot of motor functions, lost the ability to walk, talk, communicate, anything like that, and within six months' time, he was in a vegetative state. Uh, completely non-responsive, couldn't respond to stimuli of any sort, no eye movement. And he lived that way for 10 years until he passed away at the age of 16. Uh, so that happened when I was one years old, passed away when I was 11, and unfortunately that's the only brother that I know in my life. But uh, because of his misdiagnosis, I was diagnosed correctly. Uh, at the age of one, they knew I had ALD, so that was five years of planning until I was six years old and I did everything that, you know, Janice was talking about. It's the MRI scans, it's the blood work every six months, but it's a peace of mind. And finally, at the age of six, started showing signs, and my parents decided to go ahead with bone marrow transplant. So um, back then, uh, bone marrow transplant, that was done in 1998. So this past month, celebrated my 20 years post bone marrow transplant, uh, which is pretty impressive. It was a non-family member even, uh, six for six match, and you know, those five years just, there's so much planning that gets to go into that. And that was 20 years ago, 1998, a bone marrow transplant done, and it was incredibly successful. I can't imagine what they're doing now. I think there's more even um, biomarkers that they use for bone marrow transplants. We have gene therapy that you can use for treatment, and we, we have the tools and ability to fight this disease. You can end up just like me, which I think is pretty amazing. I'm pretty content with life. <laughs> um, we're just fighting the battle of catching it now. So uh, that's what I have to say. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Dean. Hi, my name is Dean Gilbert. Um, I, I have AMN, the adult form. I was diagnosed at 39. I started having symptoms at 37, and it took me two years to figure out what I had. You know, at that point, I'll just talk about me a little bit, then I'll go into what I want to talk about. At that point, I was going through a divorce. I'm a new single dad. I was told that I had a 90% mortality rate disease. I was told I had to quit my job. I had a great career. You know, I was given some misinformation from the neurologist. I thought my life was over. So a year later, I told the doctor I wasn't going to quit. I'm doing good. You know, I was healthy. I was perfect in my eyes. And uh, a year later, I did have to go on disability. So now I'm a single dad, you know, raising my kids. I'm on much less income. If I think if I would have known about this ahead of time, you know, it could have changed my life. I could have planned for it. But that's all about me. Anyway, what I see now, you know, the social media is a big aspect. I started a Facebook page for this. I see a lot of families with children that are affected. Kind of gets me because I got two, two kids. And 
you know, I see them, I usually meet these people on social media after their kids are diagnosed, you know, but I see videos and I see pictures of these three, four, five-year-olds playing out in the yard, playing with their dog, doing all those things, and a few years later, they pass away. And, you know, it's so heartbreaking. And a simple pre-screening, you know, to save these children's lives would make a difference, not just in their life, obviously, because they're going to live, but their siblings, their moms, their dads, their cousins, their grandparents. You know, it's, it, this child will be able to live and affect all these other people's lives positively instead of hurtfully. That's all I have to say about it. Thank you. I would like to also add something that I forgot to say, is that often some of these babies that we're identifying, we're going back and screening their older brothers and identifying them too. And not only that, but then we identify the mother. And the mother has sisters who haven't started families yet, and they can get screened, and then they can choose alternative forms to have their family so they're not passing this gene on. Or if they already do have kids, then they can screen those kids too. So when Minnesota started screening last year, they have bigger families up there, I guess, so they are finding it. The numbers are just um, incredible up there. But just like Kennedy Krieger is the two, this is years ago when they had identified 1,500 boys they screened other family members and traced it to over 20,000 other family members. So this is not really a rare disease. This is a lot more prevalent than people realize. And the unfortunate part about it is it's more prevalent now because we keep having children without knowing that we're getting this disease. To and them. that's, newborn screening has indicated and shown us that this disease is more prevalent than we had previously thought. It was 1 in 50,000 when my son was died. Yeah, and now we're down to almost 1 in 10, 1 in 15,000. And <clears throat> early detection, newborn screening, early detection gives us the ability, like Janice has said, now other family members can get screened. And then it's this, just this big connected web. And then all of a sudden, oh, my aunt has it, and she, but she hasn't had kids yet. Now what's she going to do? And now she has to make the decision, which is, do I want to pass this gene on? And generally the choice is, no, I'm going to adopt. Well, then guess what? If this continues over the next 10, 20, 30 years, where we're now enabling people to make choices, we actually have in our power the potential to end ALD to end this disease once and for all, to push this disease out of the human genetic code once and for all. Now, that's going to take time. That's not going to be easy, but it's within our grasp now. And moving newborn screening here in Arizona is just one step towards that goal. And then someday all 50 states are going to have it. And then someday... We're going to have such a firm grasp on this disease and its effects and how many people and how to deal with it. And then maybe within my lifetime, ALD will be an afterthought. Who knows? They're actually screening in the Netherlands right now. Uh, yeah. The U.K. is getting ready to screen, as is uh, Australia. And yeah, I mean, this, is a global, this is a global disease. This is a global <laughs> phenomenon. One thing I want to add before you have know, any questions is XALD is back in March was one of the stores we're also waiting to hear back from uh, our vendor about multiplexing into one of our existing platforms. And I think yesterday we also heard that they're ready now to take a quote for uh, for that as well. So yeah, Perkin what, Elmer has the FDA approved. Yeah, we have the, the Perkin Elmer's and um, a few other bits just to add. This is this disease is on the national rust list, recommended uniform screening panel. It's already on there. What's that? That's why we're invited. That's why we're here. Is, you know, <laughs> we're trying to move this along. We're trying to move the chains forward and get this passed because this is so critical. Um, and so let's do it. Uh, um, John Baker from California. You have some experience with screening with the newborn disorder diet, right? I do. Uh, hi, I'm John Baker. I'm a clinical and biochemical geneticist. I'm new at Phoenix Children's. 
I have been involved in newborn screening for the past 30 years, actually, first in West Virginia, most recently in California, and I was actually a member of the newborn screening committee there as the representative for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, so I'm pretty familiar with newborn screening, uh, top to bottom, and implementation of all of these things. And, you know, I think everybody sort of is aware of the issues. And I've actually and I've written papers on cost effective, so I'm a believer in newborn screen. <laughs> uh, but like many things, there's the devil in the details of things. Uh, for example, with adrenal leukodystrophy, screening will save lives. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I would, when we implemented it, we found family members where there was an adult somewhere in the family who had died of Addison's disease, or what seemed to be Addison disease because they were 30-year-old who was previously healthy, developed an illness, and died. Probably Addison. Yeah, and the Addison's, I'll explain that, Addison's is what's called adrenal insufficiency. And that, that can come out of nowhere. So you're, imagine this, you're a perfectly healthy 10-year-old boy. You're an athlete, you, play, you run around, play soccer, you're totally healthy not a care in the world, and then out of nowhere, Addison, Addisonian crisis hits you, and you're hospitalized, and potentially your life is put on the line. With newborn screening, it ain't a surprise. You can prepare for it. You can plan for it. You can get tested for it. You can know that it's coming and save your life. So and, and those are the upsides, and it will work for those things. Like all things in life, there are downsides as well. Uh, I will tell you that when you begin screening, the, the screening is done on the C26, so it comes up in tandem mass as your original screen, but you've got lots of false positives to deal with. Yeah. So, so then you have to go to DNA. Uh, once you go to DNA, you still got lots of false positives because you end up with lots of variants of uncertain clinical significance, which brings up one of the downsides, and that is the parental anxieties that you then induce. I will tell you, I had women mothers who were in therapy, literally because of the anxiety created by what may have been nothing. So I, yeah. I think it's always important to look at the upsides to things and to also look at the downsides. Now there are ways to eliminate the potential downsides, okay? But those comes with costs as well. For example, in the Netherlands, they are generally reporting boys who have adrenal leukodystrophy. Whereas in California, the choice was to, choose, to report it for everyone, okay? Upsides and downsides. If you report it just for the boys, you, you will not have those <clears throat> anxiety-related things that you have to deal with because for the most part, you're, even when you do the follow-up testing, you can do it very long-chain fatty acids and studies and then work out some of your variants. You can't work those out in girls. <laughs> because there's just not a definitive test in girls. Um, so it's, the, the downside, of course, is, is that there are just as many girls born as boys, and so you'll miss some of the families who may go on to have a boy, and now they don't have the reproductive choice. So I, I know the arguments, <laughs> and I know how they play out. Uh, and, of course, the other thing is, is you have to decide in all the wisdom in the room can't do all of these at once because there's there's a big thing to do. And, and there's other disorders. California has also implemented Pompeii screening. So I haven't heard that here, but I'm assuming that somewhere somebody's not. Uh, there's, there's all of these other things, and each of them have costs. Each of them have, um, and the more we do more move more screening, the, the complexities here become not only at the newborn screening level, but at the clinical level of implementation. And so I don't envy your task of even deciding order to some of these things, uh, other than to say I wouldn't implement them all at once. <laughs> yeah, and let me say a few other things. The false positive, the issue with false positives is an issue, but I don't believe that it's an issue that should discourage us from newborn screening. Rather, it's just an issue to address and to overcome. It's not an issue that should tell us, no, don't do this. It's just an issue that we need to work through. 
Additionally, there are a lot of other complexities with what happens when a family does get diagnosed. Who do they meet with? What do we tell them? What's the standards of care? All those steps and, and getting them ready, it, that's not an easy process, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of information and I personally am in touch with a few other families and people out here in Arizona that with ALD, there's a family out in, in Avondale, uh, David and Marcella, David is a boy, he's about 24 years old with ALD, he has some cerebral issues, but I'm happy to volunteer myself as someone that can become a resource when we do implement this to help us as a community, as a state, meet with those families and talk to them about this disease and what they can do and what needs to get done and following the standards of care. Well, I also run a support group, and I'm part of the ULF, United Lucas Distribute Foundation, ALD Connect, the Milan Project. Yeah. So we offer a lot of support to these a families. And I can tell you, all the families that I know would rather have the anxiety that they're do dealing with right now than having this disease come up and hit their kids on the side of the head and not have anything that they could do. They tell me over and over again, I'm their fairy godmother. That's what they call me. Yeah, and I would I would happily accept the false positive for one true diagnosis if oh you ask you know what's what's the harm in a false positive other than anxiety and stress and like you know okay you can deal with that but to save someone's life I think it's worth it. She only had one chance to save someone's chance. life. Yeah. Um, before any questions, I just want to take a quick poll. We still have a call of the public uh, portion. I wonder if, if by a show of hands, any members of the public who have the intention to speak, I just want to get a sense for timing since we're coming up to the two hour mark. How many people? If there's time, I will take just a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. All right, thanks. Any questions from the committee for uh, XALD? So you're still waiting to hear from the vendor? Well, we just heard uh, okay. yesterday afternoon that they are they're open to having us okay. inquire about. Yeah, yeah, but we don't know. We don't know, we don't yet. know yet. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious why the cost seems to be so much higher for this claim. Didn't I hear? Didn't I hear somebody say that the cost per test was? Did I hear ten dollars? Ten dollars. That was in Washington. I'm not sure. I have to look. I haven't looked at. Uh, oh, but it made me curious. And that's testing for a variety of diseases, not just ALD. Oh. Yeah, they included some. So that was a pack. Well, that that we took care of and two other yeah. diseases that have uh, the first show high C26. Yeah. yeah. Uh, part, part of it's simple. Uh, pulling C26 off the tandem mass is just one one more piece of data that comes off along with all your other amino acids and isocarnitine, so there's almost no cost for that, almost. Uh, the cost comes when you then have to go to the reflex to the DNA testing after that. It would be all the very long chain test. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we do the call to the public, uh, we don't have any presentations for Pompeii and MPS1, but I will say for both of those, the lysosomal storage disorder is probably going to be a much higher cost because that's a whole new suite of instrumentation. Plus, there's a space issue uh, that we have to contend with. Um, uh, so, anything else before any other committee uh, comments or questions before we go to the public? Yeah, so, so in terms of process, um, is, is um, I, mean, there's, I think it's a $36 cap on the fee right first, now. First yeah, mm -hmm. for the statutory. Yes. Right. Um, so are you at that level now? Yes, we went to that level to pay for skin. That's what I right. got. So if we so that's a disrespect back to your original comment. So in order to add these tests we would potentially have to eliminate something else right. or go back to the legislature and ask them to increase that cap. Right, and that's what happened with KID. I believe yeah. the recommendation from the committee happened in 2014, but then there was the yeah. funding issue that took two or three years to actually work out before we could okay. actually add it. And in addition to that, there would be a potential cost for you to change your instrumentation, although that could be recouped through an increase? Right, that's what it would have to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So word, is it a fee cap issue or is it an appropriation issue? Uh, it's both, potentially. I mean, we have the 
even under the assumption if, uh, you know, if we just did, you know, I don't know what Perkin Elmer is going to come back and say the cost for the, for the even though it sounds like you just add C26, I think it's a new reagent kit to for our tandem mass specs. I don't know how much. Assuming it's not that much money, if a decision was made at the, at the agency to just absorb it in our current budget, which, you know, we don't really have, but if that decision were to be made, as I said, if it's our appropriation is so low compared to our cost, that could only be borne by cutting, finding savings somewhere else in our current program. If for that it's a little more expensive or some of these other disorders that are more expensive, we'd have to then look at increasing our fee, which would then go into, uh, you know, there'd have to be a legislative solution to that. I would also wonder about, um, we mentioned just doing the screen on mails, and I would think that that would not be minutes before somebody came up and said that was discriminatory. Yeah. <laughs> Board, when, when we're mentioning fees, is that just for the laboratory test, not the scientists to run the test, the follow-up staff no, to provide follow-up? When we say fees, it includes all, every, all the program fees, all the program elements are being Can I ask, I don't know how it works here. Is that $36, is that per person or per screen? In other words, since it's for your two screens, right. say, is it a total 72 or is it just total 36? Uh, no, it's uh, actually a total of 100 and, what are we at? 11, 101. So it's 36 dollars for the first screen and 65 dollars for the second screen. There's an historical reason I can get into actually. <laughs> sort of imbalance like that. Um, Ma'am, you wanted to uh, please if you have. One yeah, sure. Um, I know we are running short of time, so I shared my story back in March. But since we have some new members today, maybe uh, I'll just take a couple of minutes. So I'm a parent, uh, I have a daughter, she's two years old, and she has SMA, type 1, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, she was diagnosed when she was five months of age. It took us a long time, and uh, that's when she received Spinraza. I just want to say that um, had she been diagnosed much earlier, when she was born within the first few weeks and had gotten Spinraza, probably she would be walking and standing today. Uh, because I've seen other kids, you know, who got it much earlier uh, because either they were part of clinical trial or because they had elder siblings and they knew the history. Uh, so I think Spindraza and also the other gene therapy, which is, you know, pending FDA approval, that's the game changer now. And it really makes a difference, especially for SMA type 1s. And also the other types, if, you know, we catch it pre-symptomatic stage, as, you know, iterated before. Uh, other question that came up, you know, why since this is part of also prenatal screening, you know, carrier screening, is I want to share my experience uh, for my first pregnancy. We were not offered, um, we were offered cystic fibrosis because maybe the statistics is higher, but since there was no family history, you always think, okay, you know, we are healthy, there are so many other genetic screening, um, you know, uh, diseases, and a problem is going to happen only in my neighbor's house. We are perfectly healthy, so we didn't opt for it. Uh, now we know the history, you know, we, for the second time, obviously, we were more uh, cautious, but, yeah, I think um, newborn screen will definitely change, uh, you know, the, you know, it will make a change of, you know, like day and night, day and night difference just because we have spin now and also so many other therapies which are really promising. Um, for my daughter, and I know there are two others in, in Phoenix itself, um, there, was a, there was a difference of just uh, one and a half months. The other kid was diagnosed a little bit earlier, and she got spin rather earlier, and there is a huge difference in the motor milestones that they've achieved. Uh, so I really think, you know, if she had started the therapy right when, you know, she was born within first month when uh, she didn't show any strong symptoms, she would have had, uh, she would have not had a lifelong of severe disability or, you know, it would have changed a whole lot, but yeah. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. So I guess for any motions? Uh, yeah, I'd like to move the uh, state of Arizona move forward with newborn screening for adrenal especially for adrenal hypertrophy uh, and for spinal muscular atrophy. Thank you. Second. Okay. Thank Did you. How about the uh, I'm not. I'm not sure about the other two. I like to. Your presentation, uh, uh, but I'm not. Somebody else would like to make that motion. Uh, I, I need to go down, uh, uh, what do you have? 
I would have been my book. You're asking about it. Yeah, I was just asking if you were purposely excluding them. No, I'm not. I, I, but I think I think a better hearing of them yeah. is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Should we but do I, but I, believe me, somebody else would like to make that motion. And, I, and I'm fine with that. I just want to make sure that you know that any any recommendations we make here um, does not put the department sort of out of whack with the budget, so then you feel forced to then evaluate those tests that we are currently doing, and we can't eliminate those without hearing from right. from those folks as well. So it just seems to me that it, somehow this is going to have to fit into the budget box, or we're going to back at the legislature, right. which I, I have no no problem. It's what we do all the time, <laughs> all uh, but it's just to let all the stakeholders <laughs> all know that. Governor Ducey, I have contacts. I can get straight to them <laughs> right away. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I can go straight to them. So yeah, I mean, what happens is this is a recommendation to the director of the department. She takes in all of these considerations in mind before she makes a decision. And in this instance, since we don't have the cost yet, we would take the recommendation, and once we have the cost benefit analysis, then we would forward it. So it would be recorded as you know, if, it, if a recommendation is made, we record it today, and once we have the the uh, cost benefit data, then we forward it to her for consideration. And can I just ask one more thing? So I heard somebody suggest, uh, Dr. Baker, say don't recommend them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Would it make sense to um, do a, a tentative recommendation with the um, caveat that after we got the other presentations that we then look at order for implementation recommendations as a total, um, or that we um, approve it um, with, uh, uh, again, the caveat that we're, we're going to look at the uh, total recommended for, um, for this next session and, and get some priority to that. Uh, based on uh, uh, both the frequency, uh, cost, and the severity of the disorder. Well, also keep in mind that, the, as I said, the recommendations, even if you recommended both disorders today would be added, they would, the implementation isn't automatic. If, if the director said, right. yes, I'm interested in this, it's still going to be dependent on all the factors you've but listed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Of, course, of course, you could do it independently right. of us completely for all of these disorders, right? right? But I think at least we need to weigh in on, on the appropriateness of this. Right. right. Did I get a second? Yes. 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 So should we do it? We'll do it on time. Each one individually. So XALD, maybe by a show of hands, uh, how many support uh, moving forward with the recommendation? Uh, Deb Ludington, are you still with us on the call? May have uh, gotten dropped. All right, so that looks uh, that looks like it's passed. And for same for um, SMA. Show of hands. All right, so recorded. Both uh, both have passed. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I think we unless there are any other comments. Uh, hold on one sec. Any other comments from the uh, committee? I just want to thank all of the family members yeah. for coming today. It was important that we hear from them. So thank you. So my question is um, perhaps moving forward on the cost estimates for all four disorders. Um, does it make sense that, that next time we consider the other two that we have some cost information at that point in time? So we in the past produced cost estimates for Pompeii and uh, probably for MPS1 we could do the same. Okay. I mean, yeah. Did you have a comment? No. Yes, What's the process now moving forward? Obviously, we got to move this budgetary concerns and implementation program. What's the steps moving forward now? Right. So what happens from this point is the formal recommendation has been recorded uh, by the statutory language requires that upon presentation to the director, it has to be accompanied with cost benefit information. And as I said, we don't have the cost benefit sure. information yet. But once we compile that, then we forward it to the director for her consideration. She can decide either, no, we're not going to do this, or we maybe need to table this for a while, or yes, let's move forward, and then starts the process of she then has to go through the governor's office, and then, I mean, she, yeah, she probably has to get approval through the governor's office, and the budgetary issue would probably require some solution, some legislative sure. 
uh, you know, that I some of the some money around that it's kind of hard to predict what that would take or right. what the timeline would be for that. So okay. this is just kind of an initial step. Okay. Thank you. When is our next? I'm sorry. When is our next meeting? Uh, there's generally a minimum of annual, but like I said in the beginning, if you wanted to make a recommendation well, to meet again in six months. Well, I, I think we should meet again in six months and look at the other two disorders. Yeah. Okay. Did we not look at them today because there weren't enough time or the people didn't come to present or where? There were just no presentations. There was no information in the, in the binder. Previously, when you have asked for funding um, before, have you only done a cost-benefit analysis for DHS? Or have you looked at the system impact and, and what other um, sister agencies um, have had fiscal impacts and have the other agencies also brought their financial impact to you to present over to the governor? Right. The last time this came up, we didn't have the manpower on staff at that time to do the, the full cost benefit analysis, like you said, for all the benefits for all the agencies across the state. But what we were allowed to do was present the cost to the program of ADHS to do it, plus a couple of cost benefit analysis, similar, done similar cost benefit analysis done in other states, to, which included some of that information in terms of cost of treatment, cost of treatment for non, you know, if it's not identified and that kind of thing. So for this, uh, you know, it, I guess it'll be probably something we'll ask uh, the director how what she would prefer to do. So um, I'm definitely willing to support and from an early intervention perspective and Division of Developmental Disabilities perspective, I could support in getting um, a fiscal analysis done. Of what the current situation is of um, how much we are expending on children and even okay. adults. We'd have to do the same for access. And, uh, yeah, right. right. We did that for kids. Right. Yeah, I thought access is something on scale. <clears throat> we shared the information and right. the actuaries were busy in terms of looking at the projected benefit in terms of the because we have maybe one or two individuals a year for these kids. So I, I'm assuming, Ward, this will be the same thing. You and I will share information. Yeah. 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 All right, so we've recorded the, we'll try to get a, a meeting scheduled for the six months. And, and hopefully there'll be some presentations there. Yep, we'll try and round up, we'll try to round up something. Thank you, everyone. We have presentations for Pompeii. All right. We will adjourn. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Thank you. All down to you.